So today we have Dr. Grass here from OU. He's one of the archaeologists there at OU. He's also a part of the Oklahoma Archaeological Society survey. And you've been there for quite a while. But uh, today he'll be talking to us about the archaeology of prehistoric Wichita villagers in western Oklahoma, which is kind of how I've gotten to know Dr. Grass here. Whenever I was an undergrad, I was doing my undergrad in Brown Weatherford, which is part of western Oklahoma and has a number of these Wichita village sites around it. And so I would find stuff, try to read about it, figure out things about it, but it always seemed like there was something <coughs> I needed a question answered about. Then whenever I went to OU, I was real close to the home base there, which meant I could bug them however often I wanted to. And I can't say that was good for them. No, it's always good. But I got a lot of my questions answered and got to know quite a bit more about archaeology in general. So it's been a real pleasure for me to get to know them and share some of the stuff that I found. And hopefully it's been okay for them too. Very good. But uh, I guess I'll turn it over to you. Okay. <clears throat> As Jason said, I'm going to uh, do a kind of a general talk. And <clears throat> when most people think of uh, Native American sites in Oklahoma, <coughs> Native American groups, you think of pretty mobile hunting and gathering groups after bison, teepees, that kind of thing. Well, actually in Oklahoma, from about a thousand years ago till historic contact, there's a major part of the societies in Oklahoma were sedentary village societies. They hunted bison and buffalo and deer and other things, but they lived in permanent villages, agricultural villages, where they grew corn, beans, and squash and other plants and lived in permanent houses and went out on hunting groups, hunting forays with teepees and stuff, but not for only small parts of the year. Most of the time they were in one place all year and tied to sedentary villagers. This kind of adaptation uh, developed in western Oklahoma where they were strictly bi hunting bison and trading with other groups in the late 1500s <coughs> and into the historic period and actually when the horse came in after Coronado and other Spaniards moved in in the 1500s. Uh, that's when it really blossomed into what we think of as a plains uh, subsistence and plains uh, society adaptation where they're hunting. And even then, groups like the Wichita, which were the, one of the major groups in western Oklahoma, were sedentary agriculturalists still until the, uh, well, they still are sedentary, but they uh, lived in permanent villages into the 1800s and later. Uh, so what I want to talk about is these early villagers, and they're, like I said, tied to the Wichita groups, and we're going to look at what they looked like in terms of the archaeological records. So I'm being, it's fairly general, but in the western part of Oklahoma, the western half of Oklahoma, you get uh, predominantly people adapted to the grassland plains, and that's what we're talking about in uh, this time period from 1,000 to uh, 1800 and later. Uh, before that, the, they developed from groups on the plains that were primarily hunters and gatherers, but they also had limited <coughs> agriculture. And if you look at Oklahoma, there aren't very many sites down there on that state. Well, this what we call Plains Woodland period from about 300 BC to 900 or so AD. Uh, the, this was a very, this is a there's a lot of sites out there with it, but there's very few investigated. They're small campsites usually and hard to find and often buried a little deeper. And they're in the uh, bottomland settings that get buried deeper. But we know there's woodland groups out there that these Wichita people developed from and became agricultural societies. So the first corn, the bow and arrow, and pottery came into Oklahoma about 2,000 years ago. And that's the basis for the adaptation that we see 1,000 years ago and on up. And all across the plains, it's similar in that way. In terms of the plains village period, there's a lot of different characteristics, but I'm going to talk about villages. In other words, they're permanent multi-house structures at, uh, at the sites. Some of these later in time were actually fortified villages. And we'll talk about that a little bit. Substantial houses made out of wood and grass thatch. Some of them clay-lined. Uh, 
subsistence is dependent on bison, but also <coughs> fish are important early on and a variety of other animals, and also the cultivation of plants, particularly corn, beans, and squash, but also native plants, and we'll talk about that. And storage of materials. If you're living in one place, storage of food and, and other utensils and uh, tools and stuff are important. So we get pits for storage, hanging in houses for drying corn and stuff, and drying meat, smoking it to preserve it for year-round, various other aspects. And, and the main aspect of drying meat is the production of pemmican, which is a dried mixture of meat, uh, fruit, and uh, you dry it and it can be preserved a long period of time. Uh, when you're living in a sedentary location, you can make and produce a lot of artifacts and use a variety of tools. When you're more mobile and you have to carry stuff, you have much less variety or you want to carry much less stuff anyway. But in these villages, there's lots of tools. The characteristics are triangular air. I'll show you pictures of some of these triangular air points. Uh, bison, bone tools made out of primarily bison bone and uh, pots, pottery. Uh, if you're sedentary, you can use pots to cook and store stuff in without having to haul them any great distances. Also, during this time, there's an increase in long distance trade. You can actually find trade from the southwest and southeast that goes as far as the Pueblos in New Mexico and into eastern Arkansas and southeast and northeastern Texas. Um, however, up until historic contact, most of these tribes were fairly egalitarian. They had chiefs and, and things like that, but they're elected or uh, they're important individuals that become chiefs, so it's not an hereditary inherited type thing. In the historic <laughs> uh, period after contact with Europeans, it becomes a little more complex and develops, but most of them are egalitarian societies, what we think of as uh, pretty much equals. Uh, there's a lot of ceremonialism, but we find very little flimsy evidence on that archaeological. We have very few uh, ceremonial goods and excavations and burials are limited for various reasons, but uh, we do know that they were doing, practicing quite a bit of ceremonialism. Uh, in Oklahoma, there's a lot of sites of this period from 1000 to 1800 AD. I put a few of them on this uh, site if we're up here. Uh, we've excavated actually some to the west of us in, in a lot of areas. A lot of the, what I'm going to talk about is based on work along the Canadian and Washita rivers, some along the Red, and some along the uh, Arkansas and Cimarron, but uh, the, the Washita's probably had a lot more work done on it, simply because there's a concentration of villages along that river that were occupied for a long period of time, and there's been more archaeological work on it. The adaptations in this period, what they were eating, how they were living, are really similar with variations in some tools and stuff that gives us an idea of the different tribes or groups that were in the area. If you wanted to define cultures in the area, we can define a lot of variation in western Oklahoma and some of the various subgroups that we think are in this area. You'll notice big blank areas, that's not because there aren't archaeological groups in this, archaeological sites in those areas because they haven't been investigated enough to know what's going on. But again, the Washtar River is a big center. Texas and Oklahoma Panhandles had quite a bit of work. Uh, we've now been working up here on the Arkansas River a little bit more. You'll notice this area where we are has a pretty good blank area. It's, it's probably one of the least documented in terms of archaeology in the state simply because we haven't been up here very much doing very many, much archaeological work. But we do have a few sites up in here that we have some idea what's going on. So about 900,000 A.D. to 1450, you get the prehistoric complexes, and they continue into the historic period into the 1800s uh, and later. Uh, most of the settlements we see in this period are anywhere from a few houses to up to 20 structures in a village situated along river terraces. This is the Washita River in central Oklahoma. In this particular area, there's villages every half mile or so, or, or, or less sometimes. There might be one here, one here, one here, that kind of thing. They're not all occupied at the same time. People lived in these villages. After a period of time, they hunted out the deer and the game in the area. It became harder to exploit them. They moved down the river a little ways and camped in, and started in another village. Also, houses tend to wear out in 10 or 20 years. Instead of rebuilding, they move the whole village. 
Their population densities are fairly high, but they're nothing with that, uh, what we think of in terms of keeping people from moving up and down the river valleys and to different river valleys. Well, how do we find these sites? There's some of them are deeply buried. This is a buried horizon. There's actually a site on top. There's material coming out of this buried soil and this buried soil. We dated this one at uh, 1600 years ago. So in the last 1600 years, uh, this is about 25 feet top to bottom. So there's 15 feet of soil built up along this river terrace in the last 1600 years. This one up on top dates to about 1,200 years ago. This one would be, we don't have dated, but it would be between there and there. So the, this is an occupation where one of the Plains villagers is living. This would be in that woodland period that would predate it. So if we can find woodland material down there, it's pretty hard to dig down that deep. We have very little information on that deep one. Uh, but the other thing is you can see stuff coming out of the river. This is a a storage pit that was filled in during occupation of the village. There's another one here, another one here, and actually another one here. So sometimes the river cuts in and gives us a nice side view of some of the activities. You can actually see post holes from where houses were and stuff in the river sometimes. But they're cutting away, so we want to dig down and get an idea of what the houses and where they are look like. Many of the terraces <coughs> are plowed and we see stuff on the surface. You can, I don't know if you can see if there's a nice dark soil in this area. That's uh, an occupation site from about 800 years ago. And it's dark soil because that's where all the organic trash was thrown when people were living on this site. There are pits and houses in this area that date from 800 years ago. And they extend along this terrace uh, edge in the Rostar Rivers over this area. So, you could actually pick this out in the plowed field because the rest of the terrace doesn't have this very dark soil when it was plowed. It grows great crops for a while. We did some excavations on some of these sites. This one again along the Washtar River. You get pits, you get houses, and you get uh, trash that's thrown in uh, to this, uh, various areas, trash mounds, or sometimes it's thrown into the pits after they're getting spoiled. Most of the pits are used for storage pits. Note how big this one is. This one's about six or eight feet in diameter. We'll talk about that in a minute, but most of the storage pits are much smaller than that. So what I want to go over is what we find in some of these excavations in terms of what the houses look like, what kind of storage they had, and what are the artifacts they look like for that period. There's a variety of houses in western Oklahoma. Most of them, I remember, are made with posts that are stuck into holes as the walls and then the walls and the roof are thatched with grass. Typically in the southern plains that's what we find. They're usually uh, square to rectangular and they have a hearth in the center. Uh, other than that you get a little vari variation. Some of them have extended entryways, some of them have uh, little depressions in the middle, and some of them have interior posts. Uh, sometimes if the house burned we can actually find where the post was stuck in the ground and the charred post that fell from it. And burned houses are often ideal because they kind of preserve things in place. But you can actually see the stain in the ground when it, even when it didn't burn if you excavate very carefully. And these are post molds along the edge of a house that was eventually excavated and completely. We do get some variation in villages. The earliest villages tend to have these kind of squarish or rectangular houses with extended entryways that came out, usually facing east or southeast in Oklahoma, with four center posts in the central hearth, no other interior features except some kind, sometimes bench posts and stuff like that. After about 700 years ago, you get rectangular structures without the extended entryways. Sometimes they do, but and they have two major center posts instead of four, and they have interior storage pits. So you get a little variations, but again, these are the same people that are just changing a little bit over time, and we get there, they're all made out of grass thatch, and they probably looked uh, similar in, in uh, over time, just changed slightly in appearance. This is one of the extended entryways. Notice it's fairly narrow, 
The entryway is a slit dug down with posts stuck in the bottom of it, and these are the post holes that are being excavated on this one. Uh, this would have been a covered entryway. Uh, and as usually at the in, inside of it, there's a couple posts that indicate a block for the uh, windscreen inside the house. Houses, we think, would look like something like this. Again, grass thatch on the roof, uh, posts with grass on them often, extended entryway. In this case, this one's been plastered with uh, clay. We don't know how common the clay is. It appears that a number of houses that are burned because it's fired and it makes into a, almost like pottery and it has grass impressions in it. So we know it was part of the house on some of them, but they don't all burn, so we don't know if they all had clay or if just winter houses or some other structures. Another structure we see in historic Wichita sites is the arbor, important for summer activities. You're not going to be in that house in Oklahoma in the summer very much. You're going to spend most of your activities in the arbors right next door or near to the houses. So the kind of outdoor houses. These are harder to define. You get this one just has, is depicted with four posts, but you'll often get posts lining the outside like a house, but you can tell it's not as uh, substantial a structure when you excavate it. One important difference as you go west in <coughs> Oklahoma and the Texas Panhandles is structures that are built with stone foundations and stone lower walls. Extended entryways sometimes and multiple rooms, but they're single room structures and multiple room structures. So just west of here as you get into Beaver County and Texas County and into Texas, you get these stone slab foundation structures. Again, they would have had, they have posts along the outside, you can see some of them where they would have been, and they would have had roofed over structures, but the bases of them were made with stone slab foundations. Interestingly, there's some other variation out west. You get some fairly large multi-room structures. Some of them have 10, 15 rooms in them, almost like miniature pueblos out in western Oklahoma, like they're imitating the New Mexico pueblos. And they have various sizes of rooms and storage areas in them. Uh, there's quite a few of these in both panhandles. You can tell we're out in the panhandles by the high mesas. But interesting, in recent years, we found that they also dug into the ground in the panhandles and had subterranean houses that are down three or four feet and were roofed over from the, near the ground surface. This has a, this wall looking thing in here is just for profile. So this is a oval shaped, circular oval shaped house uh, with the hearth in it here, and this is actually a storage area that had post holes along the edge that separated it from the structure. Real different uh, from most of the other archaeology we see in the area. This is what we think some of the subterranean houses may have looked like. Underground, most of it, but roofed over. It's always a projection of what the roof looked over. Some of them have entryways that come out. That one you just saw didn't have an extended entryway. It might have been an entry through the roof. Uh, this one's big and uh, more square than oval, too. So you get a little variation. Uh, other features we find uh, when we do activations is hearths that I mentioned. There's two types of hearths we see where they dig shallow basins. And you can see this one's been fired. It's got a reddish stain on the bottom full of charcoal. And then hearths that are built just like on top of the surface with rock lining. These are typically inside houses. These are typically outside structures. If you have a hearth outside in Oklahoma, <coughs> you might put it in the ground to produce, to keep it from blowing around very much with the wind. Inside, it's not such a hard thing. So we get, typically, these are inside the structures, although you can build rock hearths outside. And then the storage pits. The main facility for storing from, from, from 1,000 to 500 years ago or more, or 300 years ago, was the pit. Dig it into the ground, makes a nice cool storage area, preserves your, line it with grass, sometimes with caliche, various other things. You can store corn, meat in there for the winter, store your, your uh, seed crop for the next year. Here's again a kind of a profile in the river bank of one, nice cylindrical pit. This is also typical, instead of a cylindrical pit, you dig a pit down and then you widen the bottom of it. Why would you do that? Have a narrow top. Cold, 
colder under the surface, but why would you have it when it's colder under here too? Isn't it? It's easier to close off this pit if you just have a narrow neck. Also, we know from the historically that a lot of these storage pits are outside the houses, not far from them. These people go on bison hunt a certain <laughs> part of the year. If you're storing your corn and your supplies in a pit and you're gone, you don't want people to find that, do you? If they're coming in. They cover these over and they look just like the ground surface. We've actually found remnants of logs and stuff coming off and clay caps that are coming in. You can camouflage, this is historically documented in some of the plains that I've, you camouflage these pits and you, you're at least they're not going to find very many of them if some other tribes coming in while you're gone and raiding your village. So your supplies are safe. So that bell shape, not only can you store more in it, but it can be sealed and, and camouflaged more easily. So we find lots of storage pits that are that narrow at the top and bell out and later uh, lower on. These are, this one's about three and a half feet. These are three to four feet deep and it's about three feet in diameter. Uh, at the bottom and sometimes at the top if they're cylindrical. There doesn't appear to be any difference in what they were used for. Most of them, after they get spoiled, after they food spoiled in them or something, that's a convenient trash depository, so you find all kinds of trash in them. Here's another pit in the riverbank. This one is much larger. Uh, storage pit probably also. However, we find what we call mega pits, which are anywhere from 8 to 10, 12 feet uh, oval shaped. And we're not sure why they're digging them so big. Most of these that have been documented are along the Washtar River, all over us. I've heard of some that may be on uh, the uh, uh, Red River, so it's hard to say how extensive they were. Uh, when we were digging this one, uh, it was in the spring, and a tornado came over, so we are calling them tornado shelters. <laughs> but who knows? Uh, there are some that were, had a lot of ash in the bottom, and they looked like they were roasting pits. Uh, usually they're not quite this big. They may have been communal roasting for a communal ceremony where you're cooking a large amount of meat, where you get a kind of oven going, you get the coals going, then you put your meat in and bury it like you're cooking a pig today, you might do that. But in this could be a large scale, so it'd be for a whole village or maybe for a couple villages that were coming together. Uh, but they're very large features. Still kind of somewhat a mystery why you're digging such a large feature. I mentioned they're full of trash. You can see the dark organic staining in, in, in this pit. And this is a matate or grinding basin thrown into the pit, fragment two, in two pieces. So I, they're all often filled with trash. The organics in this preserve some of the uh, material that we can recover from their uh, organic material. So I'll talk about that in a little bit. And they often throw in the bones from what they're eating and, and hunting so we can identify animals that are uh, from the bone remains that are thrown in the storage pits <coughs> and across the site. You can see bison jaws and bison ribs primarily in this one and some other parts of a buffalo. And they also, throughout uh, the villages and in the trash features, you get pieces of the tools that they're using. Uh, the predominant tool for hunting is the bow and arrow. They're still using a few spear points or dart points. These are primarily probably still used as knives instead of as spear points. The bow and arrow comes into Oklahoma, like I said, about 2,000 years ago. By 900 or 1,000 years ago, it's the predominant weapon uh, for hunting and uh, warfare. Uh, there are quite a variety of points that are used. Uh, from corner notch and side notch varieties to triangular varieties. As you go through time, it changes. So in a site that has a lot of these, 900 years ago, a site that has a lot of these triangular ones, four or 500 years ago. Different styles give you an idea how old the site is. We know this from radiocarbon dating, sites that have these type of points on them, and we can tell approximately how old the site is. So an archaeologist comes and looks at your points and he says, you got a lot of these, this is 800 years old or so. That's how we, that's how we get there. The rock they use for making points varies quite a bit. In Oklahoma, we're, they were fairly fortunate in that there's a lot of chert and flint that they could use to make points and other tools. 
and some of it's very high quality. Uh, in, the, uh, in the panhandle of Texas is the Alabates outcrop, which was actually a quarry area where they actually dug for this type of chert. This is traded long distances, but in western Oklahoma there's a lot more of it, and it gets traded further east, north, and south. In north central Oklahoma near, uh, near Newkirk is a K County or Florence chert. This was also a dug place where they dug for the chert. It was so, such a good chert. They dug it. It gets traded as far out as Alva from, from Newkirk and uh, further than that, but we see it regularly out about this far. When you get a little bit further west from here, you get predominantly alabates and some other material. And then even chert from north central Texas is traded up in here at Edwards Church, a real fine quality chert. All of these are traded at this time period, but there's also other local chert. In this particular area, a chert called Day Creek, which is a white or gray chert, is found naturally outcropping in this area, and it was picked up. And then there's quartzite and chert in the Ogallala Formation, which overlays many of the hills in western Oklahoma and central Oklahoma. And you can find that material almost anywhere in those areas. So they had a variety of material to use to make their tools that were stone tools. But these particular ones were so, such fine and easy to nap that they traded them long distances. And you'll find alabates near the quarries for this, so they're trading back and forth too. This stripe is, is uh, pretty distinctive. Here's some of the locations, alabates in the Texas Panhandle, the Florence up here, the Edwards Church all the way down here in Texas, Day Creeks in this area in Kansas and Oklahoma. And there's a variety of other chirps. The Ogallala you can find almost anywhere in here and uh, includes quartzites and chirps. Um, remember, before uh, 1500, all this is by foot, no horse travel or anything. So you're hauling chirp rocks quite a ways. Uh, other tools that we find in villages, again, they're hunting bison and deer and a variety of other things and processing those animals. All the tools are stone or bone. This is the ma major knife used in terms of especially butchering bison. Diamond beveled or harahay knife. They get worn differently, but they're shaped triangularly to begin with at least. And they're beveled on the edges and they're beveled on alternate edges. This one's beveled on the upside. This one's beveled on the downside. What you do is you have this knife it gets dull on this side, you flip it over, use this side, you turn it over, use those other two sides, then you resharpen it. So it's a, it's a really convenient thing for uh, butchering bison because you can use four edges before you have to resharpen. This tool is the primary tool used for processing the bison hides. It's the, the stone scraper, usually end scrapers. They become, they're fairly small. Uh, they don't look like they process bison hides and then they get much larger as you go through time where they're using them less extensively and tossing them before they're, uh, they're used up. But most of them are this shape. They're using the ends of them and sometimes the sides of them and scraping the hides and processing the hides. You use the hides for clothing, teepees, uh, bedding, all kinds of materials. So hides, both deer and bison are processed significantly. Uh, there's a variety of other stone tools that are found at sites, but those are some of the major ones. Uh, the other thing we find in this period is pottery. In western part of Oklahoma, it's not too uh, complex or too decorated. It's predominantly plain or, or what we call cord roughing, where you have a cord wrap paddle, and you, when you're making the pot, it puts that cord impression on the pot. In this case, it's pressed vertically. Even when they're making the plain ones, they're probably using that cord wrap paddle and then smoothing it. Uh, but uh, the bases, this is the top of this pot. The bases of the earliest ones are conical shaped and rounded. As you go through time, they get uh, rounded and flattened. And you get a variety of vessels. Uh, you get some decoration on them. These are just little nodes that are attached to the top. Handles and lip tabs on them and some uh, intricate decorations on some of them, but predominantly most of them are plain surfaced. These jars are about this big, sometimes a little bigger. They're used for cooking and storage. 
We think most of the rounded to conical shaped bottoms are cooking pots because they have less tendency to break. Flat bottom ones are probably <coughs> used more for storage because if you use them over a fire where that ang sharp angle is tends to break more easily uh, from thermal fracture. And we get some trade items if you go to the Mississippi uh, sites in eastern Oklahoma, the mound sites, they tended to have intricately decorated, smooth, polished pottery, and some of that's traded out onto the plains, and we get a little bit of that. Uh, in the far western part of Oklahoma, into the panhandle, it remains cord roughing through all of it, and this is a piece of a cord roughing pot with a handle, uh, and it's sand-tempered. And it remains that way up into the 1500s, 1600s. And then that groups disappear from that area. Most of the other parts of the state are plain or smooth pottery with occasional some decorations that we looked at. Uh, other things made out of pottery. And Jason has some of these examples of points and tools from here that you want to look at up here when we, when we finish. Uh, we get... Uh, what are called spindle whorls. These are made out of broken pots uh, used for uh, spindle, spindles as the center spool on them and also some kind of decorative. Some of them are used for decorative things. They almost always have one hole in them but sometimes they have multiple holes dug, uh, pushed through them. And these are drilled through them because they're pieces of pottery that are shaped after the pot broke and then they drill a hole through them. And this is a figurine. Uh, the human figurine, but also you get animal figurines. Uh, most of them are in pieces. We can't even tell what the animals. This is one of the rare ones that's complete. A human figurine. And notice these little dots on the front of it. We think those indicate tattoos because the Wichita were known as tattoo people. And they were, that's some of the names that people, other tribes called them, referred to the raccoon eyes, which are tattoos around the eyes and on the chest. And, uh, were common tattoos. So this may indicate tattooing on this individual. What the figurines were used for, we don't really know. Other tools, woodworking tools. If you're living here 500 to 1,000 years ago, these are your main woodcutting tools. These are celts or axes. They're ground, they're made by grinding, and they're made out of a particular type of a hard stone, diorite, and they're usually sometimes called greenstone or blackstone, and they have a bit end and a pole end. Sometimes they're battered on the pole end so they can use them as wedges or you get them and use them to split logs. But this is your wood cutting tool. Other ground stone, these are pieces of abraders. This is the sandpaper of prehistory. Use it for uh, abrading any kind of tools, bone tools, but especially arrow shafts. Most of these are used in pairs and you smooth your arrow shafts by just using it just like sandpaper, and they're real common. And these are stone balls. You know, they've been rounded like marbles. They're probably some kind of gaming pieces. The other tool that you're going to use most frequently or find at sites are the hand stones or monos in the big grinding basins for grinding corn, vegetables, and maybe even uh, minerals in it, but primarily plant material. And there's a variation in what they look like and the size, but there doesn't seem to be any association with time period for that. Another type of ground stone tool uh, or that we see are pipes and tobacco. Uh, I'll talk about that in a minute, but tobacco appears in this area about 800 years ago, and most of these pipes appear about that time period and later. These are stone pipes, so they're ground. We actually have different stages where they broke them at different stages, so we kind of know how they made them. They grind out the shape, and then they drill out the hole. So we often find pipes that are almost completely shaped, and they broke them when they were drilling out these holes. And they drill them out with a, a flint drill, actually, and sand, and you can drill out. These are sandstone, siltstone type things. This one with the bird-like figure on the bottom of it is a red pipe stone and it may actually have been traded in from Minnesota. Quite a uh, catenite's a long, long distance trade, tribe to tribe. Okay, we've seen some of the tools. We talked about kind of what they were eating, but to live on the plains, if you're living on the plains, there's your cattle. 
You can go out and hunt bison and get quite, quite a food supply from one bison. Unfortunately, bison don't always show up where you want them. They don't come to your door. So often they leave villages in the fall, early winter, go out for bison hunts to supply their village for the winter and bring the meat back. You process it, bring back what meat you can in the hides and process them in the village. Um, deer, uh, fish, and mussels were also important resources and some of the earliest villagers in the central part of the state had few bison bone and much more fish and deer bone, even though bison were common. They were probably more common out west and were moving east through time. By 1300, 1400 bison were in eastern Oklahoma. By historic contact, there were bison as far as Tennessee in the woods. So we know that they were expanding eastward uh, through time by the archaeological sites and when they show up. By the same token, uh, those early villagers tended to concentrate on fish in the rivers. If you're living near the river, an important resource is what's in the river, fish, mussels that kind of thing, supplement bison and deer in many of the early sites. By 1300, bison are so common that they're hunting them predominantly in most of the villages. And you can make pemmican uh, to, to preserve many of that meat for the winter. Bison were also, and deer were also, the bones from them were also used for many different tools. If you're, having, if you're an agriculturalist in western Oklahoma, you have to have something to dig and hoe and dig your plants and, and gardens with. Most of those tools were made out of bison bone. Sewing tools, all kinds of ornaments were made out of bison and deer bone. These are bison hoes, digging stick tips. You use the leg bone of a bison, break off the end of it and haft it on to a stick. You have a nice digging stick for planting seeds of corn, beans, squash, whatever you're planting. These are the shoulder blades of bison. They make them hafted onto a stick to make great hose. This and this are the horn cores, the horns of a bison. Again, these are hafted on, and there you can see the polish on this one. This one, these are all, these are both almost worn out from using them as hose and shovel-like tools. Uh, deer bone, leg bones are uh, cut and used in the fine points that are used for awls, for punching leather, for sewing. Uh, bird and small mammal bones are cut into beads to make ornaments. Any idea what that tool is? It's made from a deer leg bone. Why would you put a hole in it? It wasn't from shooting it. This is, we think these were used as arrow shaft straighteners. When you're trying to straighten that stick, you stick it through there after you uh, soaked it and heated it, and you bend it. And it's a Fairly common tool. Uh, hairpins, ornaments, awls are real common. So you get the major tools in some of these sites besides stone are the bone tools. Um, a variety of interesting, here's some of those digging stick tips of bison. Uh, these are deer jaws and they're sickles. If you're putting grass thatch on your house, you've got to cut a lot of grass. The sickle of the day is the teeth of a deer jaw. You can half fit on the, on the stick and you have a great sickle. And actually they remain fairly sharp. And most of these you can't see in this picture have a really high gloss from the silica of the plants on them. This is an interesting tool which we only kind of know what it was used for because it's seen in some of the historic tribes. You stake, this is again the shoulder blade of a bison. You drill this hole from it and you stake it down at an angle in the ground and you draw your hides through, through this hole, it would have been complete except for this, and it's called hide softener. You take it in there and you manipulate the hide until it softens it up. And we see that in the historic pictures and rarely we discover them in the archeological sites where they're, this one's broke obviously, but it had the hole there and the wear and polish on that area. So bone tools are significant. Also, muscle shell. This particular muscle shell has cut a hole out in it. It's broken on this end. And it's used as a scoop for a little, uh, little small hoe or shovel. And some of them are not broken and polished on the ends. They're kind of like scoops. Some of them are used as bowl-like things. Uh, muscle shells can get quite big in parts of some of the rivers in Oklahoma. So they make, they make tools. You make things, other things from them. You can make shell beads. 
cut out the shell and drill a hole in it. You can have a nice shell bead. These are uh, columella shell. These are from Gulf uh, Ocean shells that were traded up in the columns in the middle of those big spiral shells are cut into, into beads. Uh, there's some indication that they're actually trading them up into eastern Oklahoma into those mound sites and then the beads and sometimes the whole columnella was coming out here and was made in the beads out here and sometimes the beads were just traded out here. Uh, most of these appear about 1250 and later. You also get those bone beads that I was talking about. Besides animals, plants were important as I mentioned. These are charred corn cobs on the, on the floor of a burned house that was 800 years old. Uh, you know, we also find burned squash. Anything that's charred gets preserved somewhat in archaeological survey if it's not burned up completely. When you char it, you stop the bacteria from decaying it, uh, at least to a limited degree, some degree. And when it gets buried, it's often preserved. These were burned and buried in this house, and they preserve fairly well. You can actually see charred seeds in uh, very small seeds if you take soil and float out the charred material. You can see how much charcoal is in this floor. If you took a sample from here, you'd probably find lots of corn fragments, but you might find other things like squash seeds, beans that got charred. And there's also native plants. This is a marsh elder or sump weed. It has a seed very similar to sunflower seed. And it was a crop prehistorically. It's now extinct as a crop, but we still have sunflower. Uh, some of these seeds, uh, corn and beans, uh, these are tobacco seeds. I mentioned tobacco appears about 800 years ago in Oklahoma. This is the actual size of a tobacco seed in centimeter scale. Uh, so these are really small. This is a microscope shot, and they're hard to find, but we have several sites in Oklahoma. One of them is about 1200 to 1250 A.D. Uh, and they, they were using them, that's the same time period we see the pipes coming in. Uh, they may have been smoking other stuff, but the tobacco is always showing up, and it's traded in probably from the southwest, where it comes up from Mexico. There is native tobacco, but uh, not very common in this area. Uh, sunflower, we don't have very much domesticated sunflower in Oklahoma. The corn, these are corn cobs. They're about that big. Uh, some of them are bigger than that, but they're not what you think of as big corn cobs we have today. They're small, generally eight to 10 row, up to 14 row. We have 14, 16 row cobs is what primarily we eat today. But they're all derived from native corns. But in this area, this is what they're growing in Oklahoma predominantly throughout this period until historic times. These, this is the marsh elder seed. Uh, it was, has all the characteristics of sunflower except the uh, shell on it's a little harder to remove. You often have to parch it to get the, and on sunflower seed you can crack it in your mouth and get it off. But on these it's harder to do so they often parch them. So fortunately we often, they parch them too much and they get burned. So we find them at archaeological sites. These are what the native wild ones, we still have wild plants today. These, you can see, are much larger. These are cultivated varieties. They don't exist as a cultivation today, but 800 to 1,000 years ago, they were cultivating this, and it extended to about 1,500, and then it finished as a crop. Fortunately, some flowers didn't finish. We still have those today. You can still collect the wild marsh elder, but it's, not, it's a fraction of the size. Uh, it's one of my, we've done a lot of sites in the Washita and out in the Panhandle and down in the Red River. Most of the marsh elder we found is in this area simply because that's where we looked. But it's interesting to note that wild native marsh elder comes to about this area, but some of the biggest uh, domesticated marsh elders from out west here. So they were, and they were using it actually in the Texas Panhandle too. Uh, some of the other seeds, you get a variety of wild plants that are collected, uh, root crops, uh, native seeds, leaves of plants. Most of that stuff's hard to find, it doesn't get charred. We sometimes see charred squash rind. Sometimes we get lucky and find the corn. Of a, a, a root crop, this is a lily. And actually lotus seeds are edible. And we, uh, several of the sites we find charred lotus seeds there. But 
kenopodium or lamb's quarter, a variety of other wild plants, grapes, nuts, all those were collected and eaten along with the ones they grew. Gives them quite a variety of plant foods. Okay, how am I doing? Okay. Um, trade, these sedentary villagers started trading longer and longer distances. I mentioned some of the stuff coming from the, the shell coming from the Gulf of Mexico. Well, those conch shells were traded up into the mound centers in eastern Oklahoma and Arkansas and Texas, and they made them into intricate cell decorations, and some of those got traded out into western Oklahoma, and we see like this uh, gorget or ornament that has two holes to suspend on the chest, and it's a man in a typical decoration we might see in the Mississippian or Spiro or some mound center in eastern Oklahoma or, or further east. And that gets traded into, Oklahoma, into western Oklahoma. We also have pottery that's much more decorated or even slipped and stained that comes from the east. And then we know they're trading with New Mexico because we get that painted pottery exactly. Uh, and you can identify which sometimes which Pueblo it's traded from from New Mexico by the type of pottery that's traded into western Oklahoma. And you can actually get, they've got the pottery so refined, you can actually get a date from a site sometimes from the pottery in western Oklahoma. And the last thing I want to mention about Plains Villagers is there's occasionally some rock art. Uh, we don't know how old all of this is, except this guy has a shield and what appears to be a bow and arrow, so we think he's from this period. And these foot and hand tracks are real common. Turkey tracks are fairly common. You have to have the right rocks in the right places and find them. But they appear, this one's in Pontotoc County, this one's in Garvin County. But occasionally they appear further west out, depends on the rock formation. To get a painted figure, you have to have it kind of protected in a shelter or cave. This one's out in the open. It's pecked into the rock, so it's still preserved. Depends on the rock, too, if it's a lighter sandstone or a road. But if it's a more compacted sandstone, it will preserve. But we do get that kind of evidence from village sites, too. Um, by 1542, when Coronado came through, there were Wichita groups in central Kansas, southern Kansas, and various parts of western Oklahoma. This part of the panhandle was already pretty much abandoned by the Wichita at this time. The Apache groups had moved down in here uh, by 1450 at least, if not earlier. Uh, Coronado discovered uh, traders and groups that were out, Wichita groups that were out hunting uh, in this area and with teepees. And he went up to Quivera, which was the Wichita groups in central Kansas. And later Spaniards went to this area of north central Oklahoma, southern Kansas, where there was another large complex of Wichita villages. There were also some down on the Red River that weren't visited at this time. Uh, between 15, between this period of 1542 and 1800, the Wichita were moving south, kind of in from Kansas to Oklahoma, and Oklahoma into, into Texas. Uh, they extended across this area of Oklahoma and Texas down to the Brazos River. By 1800, most of the people up in this area had moved to the Red River or further south, and most of the Wichita were in this area uh, when Texas was formed and later pushed back into Oklahoma when Texas settlers were moving north and selling this part of Oklahoma. Uh, I have stuff on this program for later Wichita sites, but I think we probably have enough of that. Uh, but we're currently working on one village up here that dates to the 1750s that I talked about last year, and we're still doing work on it, and it's a fortified site that's a Wichita protecting himself from the Osage and Apache and uh, Cheyenne out here. They moved down to the Red River. We've identified sites down there that were historically documented, and they talk about moving down there. And there's a fortified site on the Red River that we've also looked at and are, are doing some more work on recent work. Uh, but there's large areas of this part of Oklahoma that we know very little about, either prehistoric or historically. We know actually out here, there were some Wichita villages in the late 1700s, or Wichita groups moved up here briefly in the late 1700s, but they've never been found. I think I'll end it there. 
the Wichita ended up in Anadarko and still exists as a tribe in Anadarko, and we deal with them regularly in terms of the archaeological sites in western Oklahoma. And be happy to answer any questions. And as I mentioned, Jason's got quite a few of a variety of the artifacts up here to look at. So. Yeah. What kind of special, uh, once you find the site, is there like a process you go through to get permissions? And how do you preserve that site? <coughs> okay, that's a good question. We, we find out about sites a lot of different ways. People report them to us, show us artifacts. Uh, we go out and walk over fields looking for the debris that's plowed up. I showed you the plowed fields or the river banks. Uh, we have, uh, uh, we can get grants and stuff to do various types of things like that. So I, I don't know how many hundreds of miles I've walked in Oklahoma looking for sites. And I find you can find sites from 12,000 years ago to 200 years ago but, or, or later. But... Uh, if I was going to look for a village site, I'd look along a river or a major stream. It's interesting in the, in the panhandles, uh, there are sites along the rivers, but a lot of the major villages are up off the rivers on the small tributaries because that's where the better water, spring-fed water is. Whereas in central Oklahoma, it's along major rivers. Western Oklahoma, it's a mix, rivers and smaller streams. Get down southwest Oklahoma where there's a lot of saline, it's on the clearer streams where there's better water, the big villages. The hunting camps and other stuff can be in a lot of different places. There's a record of sites are recorded in the archaeological survey where I work in Oklahoma, so we have a record of, I'd say right around, there's about 20,000 archaeological sites reported in Oklahoma, and that's probably a small fraction of what exists. And some of those are historic, you know, log cabins or forts or whatever. Uh, but many of them are prehistoric, and they're from all over the state. And uh, so that helps us identify what's where. If you were going to look at like Alfalfa County, I think there's 30 sites recorded. If you go over to Osage County, which is a large county, I realize, but there's probably 800 sites recorded because not only do we record them, but when there's a road built or a pipeline constructed, they survey for sites and they record them. All the oil wells in Osage County get surveyed because they're Osage Indian, they're federal. A lot of federal projects have to have archaeological work done on. So there's a lot of different ways to record sites. Which ones are dug? There's very few dug because it's costly and time consuming. Try to pick sites that give you an idea of what's going on. So I have done a lot of work down here on the uh, Washita River. We probably have uh, less than 10 houses identified, I mean dug. Although I could tell you that one site, there were 20 houses. But we only dug a few of them because that's how time-consuming it is to uncover them so you can identify the pattern and stuff. And a lot of that's done with student field schools and stuff. Yeah? That pemmican uh, that kind of preserved uh, buffalo, how do they do that? Like I've, I've read about that. Um, yeah, the, the process is to combine fat, berries, and the meat. And you pound the, pound the meat into a pulp, kind of. And then the berries and the fat, especially the fat, preserve it, and then you dry it. So it's like jerking it almost. And and it, and also when it's dry like that, it can be transported easily. So if you're going out buffalo hunting, you're going to take a lot of pemmican with you because it's easy to transport. And it also has not only that, it has fat in it, which is high energy, and also the berries give you some uh, balance a little bit. But I mean, they they would find plants and stuff on the way, but. Uh, uh, it's just a it's a it's a type of process that is kind of, that was founded on the plains for drying and preserving meat, and uh, other areas do some other things. You can dry it and salt it and stuff. But uh, pemmican was a common on the plains, so that's why I mentioned a lot. But, uh, it was and it was it's apparently tasty. So <laughs> with that combination, yeah. How often do you go out and do field work? How often do I got? I spend probably three quarters of my time in the office analyzing and writing and doing paperwork. Um, we take field schools out most summers, but it's not always the same individual. So, like next summer, I'll have a field school out near Newkirk at that Wichita village again, the fortified one. And uh, then I do, uh, if I get some grants and stuff, I, last fall I had a grant down the Red River to do some work 
did limited excavation and some survey work looking for sites related to the Wichita Village down there. Actually, we ended up testing ones that were dating earlier, about uh, 13, 1400 AD. Uh, it's not as frequent as you think because it takes a lot of money and time and people to do it. And that it's surprisingly time consuming and expensive because you just don't go out shoveling. Yeah, the tool of an archaeologist is a trowel, and you don't dig very fast with a trowel. But it's not the artifacts, so it's where, where they are and what they're in relation to. So I want to find an arrow point. I want to know what, where it is in the site and what it's related to. Is it inside a house or there are post molds? So you have to look at the soil and, and dig it in levels. I want to know what's on top. And if, it, if something's underneath it, is it old? how old is that? And, and are they mixed up? Is it, in other words, some sites are occupied repeatedly over time, 5,000 years ago, 1,600 years ago, 500 years ago, or something, you know. So you have to dig carefully. So, and we use metrics, which is about a meter square, which is three meters. So you lay out a meter square and you dig down 10, in, 10 centimeters, about four inches at a time. Take everything from there, label it, put it in a bag, go to the next level until you reach the bottom. And as you're going down, you look, it's, it's a real art to identify where a post was in the soil, but you, if you, uh, if I pointed one out to you, you'd recognize it. Or uh, when you come down on a bunch of ash, what is that? Well, if you actually follow it out, you'll find out it's a hearth. It's a circular shaped fire hearth and that there's ash only in one area. So you have to do a lot of detailed work. And then that's just the beginning because it takes three or four times as much to go back and clean it and look at it and analyze it and write the report. So, yeah. Does that give you an idea? Yeah. Where are the artifacts that you find? Is there they end up, um, end up at the museum in Norman, which is the main repository of Sam Noble Museum of Natural History. But there are a number of other museums in the state that also have them. There's a museum in Lawton that has a pretty significant archaeological collection, the Museum of the Great Plains, and a few others that have some. Uh, Corps of Engineers has, uh, federal agency has some of their collections in different places too, from archaeological work on Core Lakes or something. But predominantly the work we do ends up at the museum. Where other, in fact, it has <coughs> been the repository for a lot of archaeology since the 30s and 40s, and I can go back and, and look at collections from sites back then and compare them to what I'm digging up now to see what the differences are or, or what's changing and stuff. So yeah, they're, they're all there, <coughs> cataloged in there. So you mentioned that the bison were expanding eastward. Yeah, it's an in interesting thing. So uh, in terms of what caused that well, movement? Or the yeah, that's... Um, uh, there's a general drying trend from about 1100 A.D. on, well, for a period on there, and then about, it, it increases, there's another drying trend after 1400 in the plains. And we think, I think what's happening is, although that's, this sounds strange, the bison are adapted predominantly to shortgrass prairie. And they moved east as the shortgrass prairie moved east, and also as people Expand, as these villagers expanded, one thing they were able to use was fire, and they could burn prairies near their village and draw bison into the fresh, new, short growth. It may not be short grass, but it'd be a, a new growth. And that, uh, we, we're beginning to realize that they used fire much more extensively than, than we uh, thought before. And as, you, as anybody who's, if you look at the history of the plains, if you look at like Ponca City, you see all kinds of trees there, but 80 years ago, there were no trees there, I mean, because of fires and stuff that kept them back. But it's the same way in a lot of areas of the plains. And not only people were exploiting trees, but they were burning the prairie for other reasons, but that would be one of them. And the bison population has expanded, pushed eastward. Why they went, there was a forest bison historically when, when the Spaniards and French came in. And before, we, we know there's no bones or anything earlier than I don't know the exact time, 1600, 1700 or something. So they're all expanding, but we, I've done a different work in central and western Oklahoma. And the earliest sites in central Oklahoma have very few bison bones. They're village sites. Western Oklahoma, they always have them. By 1250, 1300, 
bison are just there. I mean, they're not going very far to get them because you get all parts of the bison there. So that's our part of our evidence that they're expanding eastward. And that's part of the theory is why. Partially climate, partially people modifying the environment, and maybe other factors. So do you think that people were changing what they did, or is it just more people having a bigger impact? Um, there's both. We know there's increasing population during this time period, but it's probably a modification over time. Uh, you know, the historic records, the, the plains of western Oklahoma were so full of bison, you could, I mean, you couldn't move a train through it or whatever. But that wasn't always the case prehistorically. There were bison, plenty of bison out there, but they're not, they weren't like that. Uh, but something climatically or ecologically with the bison changed and they became more abundant and moved. And then, I don't, you know, it doesn't seem to have anything to do with the predator relationship or anything as far as we know, but it could be other factors related to it. But, uh, there is a, definitely appears to be an expansion of the herds towards the east. It doesn't mean they left the west. But, uh, so combination of different Climate was probably an important factor, but not totally. That's an interesting phenomenon. Have you ever, ever been any kind of allowance to excavate burial sites? Or, like, I, I watch a lot of, like, uh, Valley of the King on there, mm -hmm. and those, and mm -hmm. be able to identify the pharaohs, and, yeah. and they're kind of members by the artifacts that were buried with them. Mm -hmm. Have you ever, ever been permission to do that with um, the new burial sites? Yeah. Uh, the burial laws changed over time. So in the 60s, 70s, early 80s, if burial showed up, you went out and executed him. Now we're more enlightened. We talk to the Wichita and if there's a burial showing up, you know, okay, that one's going to be destroyed, bury it. But if it's not going to be disturbed, then you usually leave it. So you work with the Indian groups that seem to be associated with, the, the native groups that seem to be associated with the sites or wherever it's found. It's the same way, it works the same way with historic burials, and you work with the people that it might be related to. Um, but, uh, so yes, we can excavate burials in certain circumstances. And the Wichita are, are aware of, you know, problems arise with burials coming up and stuff, so occasionally we do. Uh, but it's not, it's not a, you just don't go out and excavate a burial. You know. Are there uh, ways to identify like, Um, buried in the ceremony that was um, surprisingly, uh, many of these villages have cemeteries adjacent to them, or sometimes the villages, the cemeteries impinge on the villages there so long. Some, sometimes the cemetery impinges on part of the old village, you know. But uh, so I, there are burials there, and you can identify. But surprisingly, few of them have artifacts in them for the Wichita for some reason. Occasionally, there's a pot or something or flint making toolkit or something. Uh, occasionally there's a conch shell or something which may indicate some status, but really there's not a lot of evidence of status in the burials. Now again, it varies how much has been excavated. So I haven't excavated a lot of cemeteries or a lot of, a lot of sites with cemeteries. Uh, but uh, identifying status differences is potentially possible, but it's not as easy as it for some groups as it not as easy for the witch does as for some other groups uh, because the grave goods aren't as elaborate and sometimes aren't there at all. Uh, if you went to the Mississippian sites, they have all kinds of grave goods and vary by status, but they're, they're also higher level chieftains at this period than these egalitarian tribes. So, but there is status differences within the tribe, it's just achieved. And, and so you may find it in burials, but it's hard, it's hard to do. Um, things like DNA and other things like that may uh, give us more insights into what how many people were moving around and stuff, but that's just beginning to be used in archaeology and it's not very extensive right now. Expensive too. <laughs> but actually there's a DNA lab at OU now. Um, so um, 
they've done, like uh, there's one student working on DNA of bison to see if they can identify bison herds. Uh, I can't remember what period. I think they're using uh, 8,000 year old bones, but uh, you can use it for all kinds of stuff. But everything's expensive. One radiocarbon date can cost $600. So. One, one arrowhead? Huh? It's like a one arrowhead? Well, you date charred material, so corn on a piece of corn or on a piece of wood. And so you date, uh, yeah, you would date uh, one of those that's associated with tools or something or a layer in a site. Uh, I like to date corn because that's an artifact for sure. Somebody grew that and it grew one year. You date a tree, you know, you're dating something that was around for 30 or 40 years and there's an error in the date anyway, so it gives you a bigger error. Radiocarbon dates usually have a plus or minus range of 40 to 60 or 70 years, so Plus or minus 40 years is an 80 year range, and there's error in that even. So I can't tell you it was occupied in 1350, but I can say it was occupied 1320 to 1380 or something, yeah, probably. Especially if I get more than one day. And there's other dating methods, but that's the dominant. One of the things I've wondered, I've been east and west to here both, and there's quite a bit of difference in the way pottery is made, but also how decorative it is is a lot mm -hmm. different. So why is it that you had a lot of the black and white pottery in New Mexico and you had more decorative pottery in the eastern parts, and the plains is pretty plain? <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a good question, and I don't, I'm not going to have a great answer for it, however, the the, it may have to. It may have some relationship to the complexity of the site. The Pueblo groups were highly socially organized because they were small groups living in, I mean, big groups living in confined areas. So you had to have a, a various complex social organization. And the Mississippian sites had such a had a, had site organizations, let alone I mean, chief, chiefs and then higher chiefs. You know, and that complexity. To show status is one thing with pottery you can use. Now the plains people actually reproduced some of the southeastern pottery out here in the plains. We know because we can source some of the clays that, that where it was made rather than it was made here on the plains, but some of it was traded. So they knew how to make this pottery, but um, if status wasn't that important, utilitary, utilitary methods were. So using it for cooking and storage, you're not going to make intricate decorations, but if you're using it as display, your wealth or your status, then the more intricate and decorated and different it is, or artsy, let's put it that way it is, the, the more power you perceive <coughs> from it. So uh, many of those pots got buried in the burials and mounds and stuff in the east, or, and they got traded some too because of their status. And, uh, some people went to New Mexico and, or traded with groups that were trading with New Mexico and got some of that painted pottery here, but it, 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 it almost, I've never s seen it show up in a grave, so it's not that much of a status sign. The only pot that I've seen show up that was a long distance trade item is there's a human effigy pot in a burial from Washita County, and it came from Tennessee, or there's one just like it. Tennessee, so it was traded in the spire in the mound networks and came out on the plains, and it ended up as a burial item. May have been some status in that, and the conch shell occasionally does too, uh, but not always. So that's the only real explanation I have. It is if you don't need to do that, if you're not displaying anything, if it's more, if your culture is more towards I'm an equal, you know, there's status difference, but there's not that much, and so. You know, you might make some good pots, but not necessarily much. You're, you're spending a lot of your time surviving, living, doing everyday activities. Women who made pottery built houses, farmed, um, sewed, fed people, so they didn't have a lot of time to, <laughs> to do a lot of things like that. The men made a few points and went out bison hunting. Uh, they had a good time, I guess. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, I mean, that's that's a traditional plain society, actually. So. I mean, it seems to have uh, been a long period of time. But you know, you know, in Oklahoma, that you know, it it may rain 30 inches here this year, most of it during the growing season. Next year, it may rain two inches, and you're not going to get your crop out. So you're going to have to spend a lot of time on stored goods or finding plant foods or trading for food. So a lot of the long distance trade, its roots may have had been able to trade food when you need it, trade for food when you needed it, move it around. Because 10, 30 miles down the road, it may have rained plenty. You know, you know that's how Oklahoma or most of the plains is. It's just hard to say. So it's not a real good answer. OK. Another thing I've noticed with what things I've found but I haven't found much. I think I have two pieces of painted pottery from the western Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. But they're pretty similar in design. But their design is a lot different than the New Mexico painted pottery, I find. I find lots of small, um, lined, sharp angles. Yeah. In, in the black and white. Right. Mm -hmm. But I don't see that in the painted pieces I found here. I see thick mm -hmm. black lines and dots and... Yeah. There, the most of the trade with New Mexico, as you might expect, was with, was with the Rio Grande pueblos, the eastern pueblos, uh, Zuni, uh, Pecos, well, Pecos and uh, Tacoma and some of the others. Um, each of those pueblos makes different pottery, at least predominantly types of different pottery, and at different times it made different ones. So actually, on the plains. You get a little bit of this pottery at least as early as 1200, 1250. By 1450, there's a lot of trade with the Southwest. In 1450 to 1600, 1700, there's a lot more trade with the Southwest. And so we get a lot more certain types of pottery. So you're look, what you're seeing is certain types of pottery from one okay. Pueblo or two or something. And you could actually send those to Mexico and they'll tell you which Pueblo and which time period it's probably yeah. from. So that, actually some of the uh, sites in southern Kansas, central Kansas, they dated them initially back in the 30s and 40s by the type of southwest pottery that was showing up on them. I mean, they've been radiocarbon dated since then. But, uh, okay. Uh, and on the, the turquoise trade, do they normally trade finished products or do they trade material or both? It appears they're predominantly trading finished stuff. Now, there is some... Uh, some material that looks like turquoise that shows up here and they were making stuff out of it, but it's a lo more local material. Okay. Uh, but that, the yellow bella shell, which comes up ultimately from the Pacific Ocean, uh, were traded through New Mexico here and uh, an obsidian, uh, another type of volcanic glass that can be used for lithics, uh, was traded into western Oklahoma also. Yeah, but after uh, 1650 or something, almost all that trade ends and they're going with the French to the east, at least in most of it. Okay. But that's another topic. <laughs> well, I think that's all of my questions. Are there any other questions from the audience? Uh, before we finish up, I want to mention that the museum is open until 9 tonight. Open until 9, yes. And there's some Western Oklahoma and a little bit of trade artifacts in the museum as well. There's some glass beads, some gun flints, and some armbands that are on display there, as well as some of the, the points and abraders that you've seen in the talk today. And so if you want to check that out, that's open until 9. All, all, all these types of artifacts that you saw today are found around here. We have, just haven't done a lot of work on the sites. So I guess we'll finish up by uh, giving Dr. Dress a round of applause. Thanks for the talk.